Now today, again, as I mentioned, we're in the end of Matthew chapter 12, and today we're going to be learning about the criteria for being a member of the family of God. And what we're going to find out is that the criteria is to be a doer of the will of God, and we're going to learn that if we want to be those who do the will of God, we have to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're also going to learn that obedience necessarily attends those who have saving faith. In fact, obedience is an indicator that someone really does have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore has entered forevermore into the family of God. That's what we're going to be looking at here this morning. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's begin in verses 46 through 48. Now, I want you to recall before we read these, in Matthew's chapter 10 through 12, we have looked at a variety of reactions to Jesus' ministry thus far. Now, as we come to the end of that section, Jesus is in a house teaching his disciples when all of a sudden his biological family come to speak to him. That's where we pick it up. Notice it says in Matthew 12, 46 through 48, while he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now, dear ones, notice here in the very beginning of verse 46, you have a reference here to the mother and brothers of Jesus. Make no mistake about it, the mother here is Mary, who of course was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. But subsequently, she did have normal relations with her husband, Joseph, and therefore, Jesus had brothers. So these are familial, earthly familial brothers. Now, on the very next slide, I'm going to show you why it's an important apologetic for us as Protestants to realize that indeed, Jesus had brothers. In short, I'm going to be showing you that the Roman Catholic Church claims, because they want to elevate the veneration of Mary, they claim that Mary is a perpetual virgin. This text will show us that that's not true, and so we'll come to that. But notice here in verse 47, someone that would have been in the house, they say to Jesus, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And so what we have here is an interruption of Jesus' ministry to his heavenly family by his biological family, Mary and his brothers. And I do think that there's evidence to suggest that certainly later in Jesus' ministry, Jesus' brothers and his mother do believe in him after the resurrection, but at this point, they do not. At this point, I don't think that they are believing, and I'll show you at least his brothers did not believe in him. And so the point then is in verse 48, Jesus is going to be asking this question, which shows a distinction between his biological and his spiritual family. Notice the question is, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And again, this question shows there's a distinction between the heavenly family and the biological family. And I do think Jesus' question here is probably a slight rebuke to his biological family. Again, why? Because they don't yet believe in him. They're not yet part of the heavenly family. They will be but they're not yet. And what this shows is that the primary concern for Christ and his mission is the family of God, that he would pay the sin debt and live the perfect life on behalf of his elect that is for the family of God. And it's apart from mere biological and familial concerns. Now, as I say that, remember in the New Testament, the New Testament writers and Jesus Christ himself wants us to take good care and love our biological families. In fact, remember Paul said in 1 Timothy 5.8 that if a man would not provide for his earthly family, that they were no better than an unbeliever. But what we're going to learn in this section is the primary importance is becoming a partaker in the family of God, the eternal family of God, and we're going to learn how that happens. But let me do a quick aside with you. A quick aside, I want to show everyone how there's great apologetic value in Jesus having brothers. Now, as I say apologetic value, remember, that does not mean we're apologizing, saying, hey, I'm sorry that I'm a Christian. I'm sorry that I belong to Jesus Christ. No, the term in Greek, apologia, 
means that we are giving a rational defense as to why we believe what we believe. Now, there are two arenas in which Jesus' brothers have excuse me, apologetic value, and that is first with Roman Catholics who claim the perpetual virginity of Mary, but second, I'm going to show you how Jesus' brothers also help prove the historicity of the resurrection. So let's begin with Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholics, in their veneration of Mary, claim that Mary was a perpetual virgin. And they do so because they want to venerate Mary to the point where really she's a co-mediator with Jesus Christ, and therefore you lose the sufficiency of Christ alone. In a sense, Jesus is demoted and Mary is elevated. Well, this text today, we see that Jesus did have brothers. Let me read to you, though, what the Roman Catholics believe. This comes right from their own catechism. I'm not going to skip anything. I'm reading it literally line by line. This is the Roman Catholic Catechism, section 499. They say this. They say, The deepening of faith in the virginal motherhood led the church to confess Mary's real and perpetual virginity even in the act of giving birth to the Son of God made man. In fact, Christ's birth did not diminish his mother's virginal integrity, but sanctified it. And so the liturgy of the church celebrates Mary as Iparthenos, the ever-virgin, unquote. Notice there in the Roman Catholic Catechism, they're claiming Mary is the ever-virgin, that she is a perpetual virgin, which means she could never have any children apart from Jesus Christ. Now, the problem with that, of course, is we're reading a text today which shows us that Mary did have, in fact, other siblings for Jesus. She had other children. Okay, now, they sense that, and they go on to try to refute this. This comes from their catechism, the very next section, 500 now. They go on, they say, quote, Against this doctrine, the objection is sometimes raised that the Bible mentions brothers and sisters of Jesus. The church is always, now by the way, when they say church, they're meaning the Catholic church, their magisterium. The church has always understood these passages is not referring to other children of the Virgin Mary. In fact, James and Joseph, brothers of Jesus, are the sons of another Mary. That's their claim a disciple of Christ whom St. Matthew significantly calls the other Mary. They are close relations of Jesus according to an Old Testament expression, unquote. Dear ones, do you notice what they're trying to do is to say, well, the Mary that had other children that seemed to be the brothers of Jesus, that's a different Mary than the Virgin Mary who gave birth to Christ. It's nonsense. And why? Because today we saw in Matthew 12, 47, in fact, from verse 46 all the way to, to verse 50, in Matthew chapter 12, the term mater for mother is going to be used five times. Not once is Mary's name going to be used. The man inside the house didn't say, hey, Jesus, Mary and your brothers are here. He said, your mother, mater, and your brothers are here. Whose mother? Jesus' mother. Who was that? It was the Mary who was formerly a virgin. That's who it was. And so there are good Catholic apologists, and I don't mean good in the sense of spiritually good, but they are at least knowledgeable enough to know that that's a big problem, more than the Roman Catholic Catechism addresses. And so they go on to say, well, wait a minute, now we're really caught because the term mother's used, therefore these brothers can't be real brothers, they have to be merely cousins. Well, the problem with that is in the New Testament, there is a different term that's used for a cousin, a nepsios. The term that's used for brother is a delphos. If, in fact, Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say that these were cousins, he would have used a nepsios, not a delphos. No, these were brothers who were siblings to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know as you're sitting there, you're saying, well, why does this matter? Because the Roman Catholic Church is claiming that their magisterium that is teaching this doctrine is infallible. And the reason why we are still protesting to this day is we are those who are as Protestants saying, no, it's Scripture alone. Scripture alone cannot err. Men can err. Canons can err. Councils can err. Popes can err. And we can have even 
the magisterium err, but the scriptures never do. At the end of the day, every human being has to choose, are you going to trust in the scriptures alone as being an errant, which states that, yes, Jesus had earthly brothers? Are you going to go, if you're a Roman Catholic, with the magisterium that's proven to contradict the scriptures? For me and my house, we're going to go with scripture alone. Now, there's another reason why Jesus having brothers is important to our apologetics. Let me explain why. I think it helps prove the resurrection. Let me put up another verse. This is from John that has to do with Jesus' brothers. Notice here in John 7, 2 through 5, they're going to be mocking him. Notice it says, Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, by the way, that's synonymous with tabernacles, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, sh show yourself to the world. Stop there. Do you notice the mockery? Jesus' own siblings, his earthly brothers, were mocking him. Why? Well, John tells us in a parenthetical for... Remember, it's explanatory. We're going to see a lot of that in this message today. For, this is why they're mocking him, not even his brothers were believing in him. His own brothers during his earthly ministry did not believe in Jesus. And yet, one of those brothers named James, who ends up writing the epistle that we have in our Bible, the, the epistle of James, ended up believing later in his life that Jesus, his brother, was the Messiah to the point of being willing to die by being thrown down and clubbed to death. Now, you can pull the wool over a lot of people's eyes, but you can't pull the wool over your sibling's eyes. If I told my older brother Tom and my younger sister Kim, <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm the Messiah, they would know that that's not true. And I think you all know the same thing. If you made the claim to your siblings or they made the claim to you, you would know that you're just fooling yourselves or they're trying to fool you. But James believed his brother was the Messiah. What accounts for the change of mind for where he didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah to be willing to be clubbed to death saying, my brother's the Messiah? What do you think accounts for that difference? the resurrection. When James saw his brother who had been crucified violently, bodily raised from the dead, he knew. You don't give your life for something you know not to be true. You give your life for something that you know that you know that you know to be true. Brothers and sisters, every fact in the Bible is important. The fact that Jesus' brothers, Jesus had brothers, subsequent to his virgin birth through Mary and Joseph, proves the Roman Catholic Church isn't right, and it helps prove the validity of the resurrection. That's one of the reasons why Bob and I, Adam Olin, the elders here at Gospel of Grace, are dedicated to teaching verse by verse. We don't want to skip anything. Every single fact in the scriptures has relevance for us in our Christian lives. Okay, now, with that, let's get back to the main idea, though, and so what we're going to see now in verses 49 through 50 is Jesus is going to explain who is in his eternal family, the family of God. Matthew 12, 49 through 50, it says, And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, remember he's in this house, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, notice here in blue, Jesus speaks to his fellow believers, those who are, I should say, believe in him, and he is saying that they are his heavenly family. And what you must be to be part of the heavenly family is one who has been born again. All you need to be to be part of the biological family of Jesus or someone else, if you're part of a biological family, and you all are, is simply to be born into this world. How are you part of a biological family born into this world? How are you part of the heavenly family? You have to be born from above. That's what we're going to learn. In fact, Jesus tells us how you can be part of the heavenly family. He says, for, that's explanatory. 
How are you going to be part of these mothers and brothers, the family of God? For, he says, whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. What does it mean that we would do the will of my Father in heaven? And by the way, the term do there is just poieo. It just simply means that, to do the will of the Father. Well, in the applications, I'm going to unpack in great detail what it looks like to do the will of the Father. But succinctly, it has to do with faith and obedience. Faith is primary. Faith alone in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, revealed in the Scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, that is how we enter into the heavenly family. And that's why Jesus will say in John 6, 29, if you want to do the work of God, this is the work that you would do to do the work of God. Believe on the one whom the Father has sent. That's how you enter in to the family of God. In fact, this should not surprise us, dear brothers and sisters, earlier on in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus warned, he said, not everyone who comes to me saying, Lord, Lord, he said, not everyone who says that will enter into the kingdom, but those who do what? Do the will of the Father who is in heaven. They are the ones who are going to enter. It's essential for every human being to know that the only family that's eternal is the family of God, and the only way to enter it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. Okay, now, with that, let's come to some applications. I have two of them for you this morning that I think are vital. Number one, we must understand that while people are made in the image of God and deserve respect and protection, only believers in Jesus Christ are children of God and part of God's family. That may be old news and old hat to you, but you know you're going to go out into a culture that believes that every single person born into this world is automatically a child of God. That's what they believe. And so we have to be equipped with a biblical worldview to say, no, that's not true. You have to be born again. Number two, we must know that doing the will of the Father involves both faith and obedience, but again, faith is primary. The idea is that obedience really follows those who have genuine faith. The only way to enter the eternal family is faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So let's begin the number with the first one, and that is in order to have a biblical worldview, I think a person must be able to distinguish between those who are born into this world, human beings who are image bearers of God and therefore deserve protection and even respect, and those who are children of God who are in fact those who have been given the forgiveness of sins. I remember watching a talk show years ago. I was probably in my early 20s, and I was watching this one talk show, and this woman who was the hostess of the show confidently said to everyone that everyone's a child of God. And, of course, the entire uh, TV audience, they all were clapping, and, yes, we're all the children of God. And I thought how sad that was because they're not. They're getting the Bible wrong. The only way to become a child of God is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And so what we have to maintain as Christians, again, is that every human being is important because they're image bearers of God. They deserve protection, but not every human being is a child of God that has the forgiveness of sins. Think about the abortion debate. The abortion debate is actually very simple. Every person who talks about women's rights it's a distraction from the real issue. The only issue that matters is what is the unborn. If the unborn are human, they deserve protection. If they're not human, you can do anything you want to them. It's all that matters. It's all that matters. What is the unborn? Let's start. I think the unborn are human beings. And if they're human beings, are we going to say it's okay to kill some human beings but not other human beings? Well, of course we're not. So let's start with being. Let's go backwards from being to human. Do the unborn have being? Well, of course they have being. They exist. They want to abort something, so they must have being. So therefore, we know they have being. But what kind of being are they? Are they lizard beings? Are they cat beings? Are they dog beings? Are they amoeba beings? Well, the law of biogenesis says that all creatures give birth to fellow creatures. Dogs beget dogs, cats beget cats, and humans beget humans. And so what this means then is what is conceived 
in the womb is a human being. It's a human being. And so what I like to do in the abortion debate, I've done this at the workout club, is I like to say, wait a minute, in the 1800s, there was an evil group of people that said some human beings should be slaves because they're really not human, and the righteous stood against them. And the guy that I remember speaking to at the workout club, he goes, yeah, that's right. I said, well, in the 1900s, you had a bunch of evil men known as Nazis who said that the Jewish human beings aren't really human. They tried to kill them, and the righteous stood against them. And he goes, oh, that's right. And I said, well, now in the 20th century and the 21st century, you have a whole group of people are saying that the unborn aren't really human, and the righteous are standing against them. And all of a sudden, he said, well, no. The righteous say it's okay to kill them, and it's the unrighteous who stand against it. Think about it. All that matters about the, in the abortion debate is what is the unborn. If they're human beings, any taking of their life is murder, period. How do we know that? Because if you have a biblical worldview, you know you answer to God, not yourself. God is the one who says in Genesis 1.27 that he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Notice, first of all, that God created Avam, Adam, mankind in his own image. A person, in order to be an image bearer of God, just simply exists. It's not something you earn or you have to work up to. You are not a human doing. You are a human being. And therefore, you deserve protection and respect. That's why, if you notice in America, it's the Marxists that don't want human beings to be able to speak their mind freely and attack the First Amendment. But it is those who have a biblical worldview, typically, who say, no, we want a robust First Amendment where people can speak their minds. Think about it this way. Eight chapters after this is written, God ordained government to restrain evil to protect human beings who are made in his image. In fact, it says in Genesis 9, 6, if a man sheds a man's blood, so by man shall his blood be shed. That's God instituting government. And what is the purpose of government? Is it to restrain evil or to redistribute wealth? Well, it's to restrain evil, to protect human beings that are made in the image of God. In fact, that's not just in the Old Covenant. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, 4, when he says, the government does not bear the sword in vain, meaning they can use it. Why can the government use the sword? For to, to protect human beings made in the image of God. That's the purpose of government. If you have a biblical worldview, you know all human beings are made in the image of God, then you're going to understand the role of government is to restrain evil. That's a biblical worldview. Now, that does not mean, however, that every single human being is a child of God and therefore has the forgiveness of sins. That is unique to those who flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something that Jesus himself pointed out. Only those who come to him by faith have the unique status of being children of God, who will, in fact, inherit the eternal kingdom with him. And that's what he says here to fellow Jews who were unbelievers. John 8, 34 through 36, remember, these are the Jews who said to him, we're not slaves of anyone. We're Abraham's children. We've never been slaves. What are you kidding, Jesus? What are you, some sort of heretic against the Jewish state? Notice how Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers and sisters, notice Jesus says in red, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The house of whom? Well, it's the house of God. Part of the family of God, the slave will not remain there. They will be kicked out, sentenced one day to the lake of fire. Now, what kind of slave is he referring to? Well, those who are slaves of sin. Who is a slave of sin? Well, everyone, as Bob DeWay was showing us, today in Sunday school, everyone who's born in Adam. If you're born into this world, you're a slave of sin. That's why you have to be born again. Okay, so the only way that you can leave the slave status is by coming to the son. Notice the difference. If you come to the son by faith, you become an adopted son and daughter, and you're going to remain 
in the house forever. Brothers and sisters, what must we do again to be an image bearer of God? deserving respect and protection, just be born, just be conceived into this world. But what must we do to be a child of God who has the forgiveness of sins, an adopted son or daughter forevermore in the kingdom of God? We have to be conceived by the Spirit, born from above, who come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of everlasting life. Those are the only children of God. It's through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, again, I mentioned all human beings deserve respect and protection, but it's only believers who are heirs of the promises that are given to Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about as Jesus being the son who is the son who manages the household of God, and once you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted sons and daughters through him. That's why Jesus says in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The only way to be those who are partakers of this kingdom and this family is by belonging to Jesus Christ. This is the point that Paul makes here in Romans 8, 16 through 18. Notice the significance of being heirs. Paul says the Spirit himself, this is the Holy Spirit, himself testifies with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, now here's the condition, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Dear ones, let's ask the question, how does the Spirit testify to our spirit that we are children of God? Well, do you know Paul doesn't specifically say, but we have a choice. We can either say, well, it's a subjective feeling that I have inside of me, or we can say it's an objective fact. I think it's objective. When you unpack the rest of Scripture, remember the Spirit is the one who inspired the Scriptures, and they are our objective. That's why John would say in, remember 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you had everlasting life. Who inspired John to say that and write that? Well, the Holy Spirit. Doesn't Paul say in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 that all scripture is inspired? It's breathed out by God. And it's profitable so much so that the man of a God is equipped for every good work. That's how the Spirit testifies to us through the objective word that we are what? The children of God that we can know that we can know. And if we are children of God, because the scriptures reveal that those who come to faith in Christ are children of God, what are we also? Well, we're fellow heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now, I think throughout the generations, a lot of Christians have kind of yawned at this because they don't see the significance of being an heir with Christ. Why? Because they think that this kingdom that we're heading towards is somehow, maybe we're just going to sit on some clouds and strum some harps. It kind of looks like one of those toilet bowl or toilet paper commercials where they shoot the little darts and you got the little floaty angels around. No, it's going to be far greater than that. You and I are one day going to rule upon the earth for a thousand years with the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. In fact, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation 2, 26 through 27. Revelation 2, 26 through 27. Please turn your Bibles there. The reason I want you to turn there is this is talking about a promise that Christ gives as to what it looks like to be an heir with him. Revelation 2, 26 through 27. Now, as you're turning there, remember, these are words that Christ gave to the church at Thyatira, but by extension, they are also promises given to all believers. In other words, it's not just the Christians of Thyatira that have this promise. It's every believer. Every believer. Notice what he says. Notice it begins by Jesus saying, He who overcomes. Now stop there real quickly. Jot this down if you're a note taker. Jot down 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Why? Because you learn there the overcomer is the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Period. That's what it says. 1 John 5, 4 through 5. How are you an overcomer? The one who has faith in Jesus Christ is the overcomer. He who overcomes, what? 
He says, And he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. That's Psalm 2.8. Now here's Psalm 2.9. And he who shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. Brothers and sisters, you and I are heading into election period, and things don't always look good in the world for Christians, do they? We're not the power brokers of our day. We're the ones who have the ideas that are scoffed at, like the idea that abortion is murder. But one day, what Jesus Christ is telling you is you're going to be the one who rules and reigns with him. In fact, Psalm 2.9 is cited where we will rule over the nations with a rod of iron. And you will be the power broker. You will be the one who determines what is right and wrong in the culture that you live. And you will be reigning upon the earth for a thousand years because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's what he's promising. That's what it means, or part of what it means, to be heirs with Christ. It means that we're given a resurrection. It means that we're given an eternal kingdom. But what must we do? Notice that's in bold. Here's the condition, and I'm going to relate this to what we learned today in Matthew 12. Notice he says, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Wait a minute. We have to suffer? We have to suffer? I thought we were saved and entered into the kingdom and the family of God by faith alone. Well, if we really believe, we're going to be willing to really suffer. When someone says to us, well, it's either death or deny Christ, we are those who say death. That's the implication. I mean, the, the fullest extent of it. So the idea then is that those who really suffer with him, they're the ones who really believe. If you don't really believe, you're not going to be willing to suffer. If you don't really believe, you're not going to obey. If you don't really believe, there's no good works. That's the idea. And so to do the will of the Father begins by faith, and it's faith alone. But yes, it will lead to obedience and to good works. That's the idea that I want you to see here that's present. Brothers and sisters, those who do the will of the Father are going to be children of God, fellow sons and daughters who will reign with him forevermore. That's what the, the scriptures are clearly teaching us. Now, what does it mean to do the will of the Father? Let's unpack that a little bit more. What I'm going to show you is that it's faith alone, but faith that leads to obedience. Notice the bullet point. Doing the will of the Father is first having faith in Christ and second, obeying his commands. Brothers and sisters, as I talk about obedience and the necessity of obedience, I want you to know that we are saved not by an obedient act, but by faith alone in Christ alone. But the obedience that flows from us necessarily attends us because we do believe. That's what I'm going to be showing you. Now, how do we know it's faith alone? Well, let's build the case. First of all, John 6, 29. Remember in John chapter 6, the Jews here were being fed miraculously by Jesus, and they loved this miraculous bread machine that they had come across. That's what they wanted Jesus for. Well, they figured if we could learn to do these miracles, we could become our own bread machine. So they asked Jesus in the previous verse, what must we do so that we could do the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. What's the work of God that we must do to enter into the kingdom of God, the family of God? We must believe in whom he has sent. The term believe there is pastuo. Now, let me cite to you from a lexicon. This is from Lonida. It's a common language lexicon that pastors will use, and I like the way they define what it means to believe. They say, quote, to believe to the extent of complete trust and reliance. Unquote. That's the verb pistuo. That's exactly right. So the idea of belief is a trust where I'm trusting in the finished work of Christ, not my finished work. I'm trusting in the atonement of Christ, not my attempted atonement by my own works. It's a trust and reliance upon the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It is a trust on who he is, the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the Mormons, not the Jesus of the Roman Catholics who just can send you to purgatory, not the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses who, says, who say that he's not really God. It's trusting in the Jesus of the Bible. 
his person and his work, that's what this is all about. And the moment you trusted upon the person and work of Christ, you were given the great transaction, the great transaction that every human being needs to become a partaker of the family of God, to have the forgiveness of sins, to be an heir with Christ, to reign with him forevermore, to be given an eternal resurrection. The great transaction every human being needs is that you have to get rid of something you can't have, namely your sin debt that Christ paid off once and for all at the cross. The moment you believe, your sin is placed upon him that he paid off. But the moment you believe, you get something that you desperately needed that you don't have any of your own, namely the righteousness of Christ. And this righteousness is credited to your account. It doesn't just well up from within, where over the years you just get to be a better human being gradually, and therefore you earn a righteous status. No, it's imputed to you. So the moment you believe, you get something you desperately need that you don't have Christ's righteousness given to you, and you get rid of something you can't have, namely your sin debt, that he paid off once for all at the cross. And so what this means is that by human works, the greatest of human works, you can never become a child, a son and daughter of the Most High. Not one single good work, not the, let's say you lived your life and you thought, well, I've just done so many great works, that will not enter you into the family of God. In fact, Isaiah is very clear. Isaiah 64, 6 says that even our righteous deeds are viewed by God as filthy rags. Can you imagine going before the Lord and saying, well, here, you have to accept these filthy rags as a payment for me to get into your kingdom and to become a partaker of your eternal family. What do you have to offer? What do I have to offer in and of ourselves? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. What kind of king would take that? Well, no king would. And the Holy One of Israel won't. And so, brothers and sisters, there's no other work that we can do where we can earn our way into the kingdom and the family of God. It has to do with faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, this is not some subsidiary doctrine. It's all over the scriptures. That we must know that it's by faith alone in Christ alone that we are justified and become partakers of this family. That's Paul's point here in Romans 3.28. He says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Notice here the verb justified. It's a passive form of dikaio. Dikaio means to be declared righteous. The passive form means it's been done by God. It's a divine passive. That we don't earn this justification, this righteous standard. It has been done for us and it's by faith. Notice the term faith. That's the noun pistis. Does that sound familiar? The verb in John 6, 29, where it says believe, that's pistuo. That's a verb. They're related. So John 6, 29 is teaching the identical thing that Romans 3, 28 is. It's by faith alone. Notice he says it's apart from works of the law. What law? Well, the Mosaic law, the greatest law that had ever been given to humanity, the law that was mediated through angels that came from the greatest mediator up at that until Jesus Christ came, that is Moses. But that law, it can't sanctify you, it can't save you, it can't justify you. And I want you to think about that for a moment. That if the works of the greatest law given to humanity, the Mosaic law, can't justify you, certainly the obedience to lesser man-made laws won't either. That's how the law of Moses shuts the mouth of every man and shows us our need for Christ. We're justified by faith alone, apart from anything a human being could do. That's what Paul is telling us. Okay, now let's see this again. Galatians 3, 7. Paul says, Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. There's pistis again, the noun. Pistis, the noun. John 6, 29, the slide before, pistuo, the idea of its faith alone. Notice, it's those who are of faith of Jesus Christ, that's the idea that are what? That are sons of Abraham. What does it mean to be a son of Abraham? Well, Abraham and his descendants are the ones who inherit the kingdom. The moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you were grafted into the family of God, grafted in to the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Let's stop here for just a moment. I was listening to Netanyahu the other day who gave a startling statistic. He said at the UN that there's been 174 co condemnations of Israel th throughout the tenure of the United Nations. In other words, as long as the United Nations has existed, Israel has been condemned 174 times. Do you know how many times other nations have been condemned? I mean, all the nations, 73 times. Think about the one nation, little Israel, smaller than the size of Minnesota, has been condemned by the entire world, by the United Nations, 174 times, when every other nation, all of them combined, have only been censured and rebuked 73 times. Why? Because the kingdom's coming to Israel. Why are all the nations trying to wipe Israel out? Because the kingdom is coming to Israel to the sons of Abraham. And the moment you believed in Jesus Christ, that became your kingdom too. That's what I'm trying. I want us to see these things, to say, wow. There used to be Amalekites, Jebusites, Amorites, Canaanites, we could go on and on. They're all gone. But there are still Israelites. Why? Because there's a God in heaven who made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And those promises last forever, and it's by faith alone in this Messiah who was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David. Faith in him, you become a partaker of that kingdom. Are you with me? It's faith alone. It's not faith plus something. It's not faith and. It's faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That's how you become a partaker of the family of God. Now, as I say that, those who truly believe end up obeying because if you really believe, you end up acting on it. And that's why, remember, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 shows us the relationship between faith and obedience. In fact, if you're a note taker, jot down Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Let me cite it for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, notice there in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, we're saved by faith alone, all by God's grace alone. But then in verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, that is God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were justified by faith alone, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, but those who really believe end up obeying and they act on it. That's what it fully means to do the will of the Father. Meaning, if there's someone who says, well, yeah, I think I came to faith some back, sometime back in you know, 1942, but then the rest of my life I lived in rebellion against God. Well, it's evidence they don't have saving faith. Think about it this way. I was trying to explain this concept, the relationship between faith and obedience to some teenagers at a Bible study, and I came up with this analogy. Maybe it'll be helpful for some here. I've used it before. But think of your salvation like a car. And what drives your salvation is the engine of faith. It's faith alone. But if you have a functioning engine, it necessarily produces exhaust, which is your works, your obedience. So think about it in reverse. Let's start with the exhaust. If you have no exhaust, no obedience or works, what's it evidence of? You don't have a functioning engine. You don't have faith. And therefore, if you don't have faith, the engine, you don't have your car running. You don't have salvation. Your engine is faith alone. But if your faith is real, you're going to be producing exhaust. You're going to be producing good works that accompany. They don't cause your salvation they accompany and adorn your salvation. And so there are certain connections that I think every Christian must have and must make. One of them is the connection and the relationship between the law and the gospel. The other is the relationship between faith and obedience. I want to tell you a story. Back during the Reformation, Martin Luther, many of you know, he did not like the epistle to James. He called it a, an epistle of straw. Because Martin Luther, as great a reformer as he was, he thought that there was a contradiction between the justification by faith alone that Paul taught in Romans 4 and this idea that we have to be justified by works in James chapter 2. 
Well, what I'm going to show you is that James is not contradicting Paul at all. In fact, he's not teaching us that it's works-based salvation. He's qualifying what kind of faith actually saves. So I want to work with you here, and I want to show you these because for the rest of your life, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, I want you to always have these two verses side by side in a notepad somewhere because once you see the relationship of Romans chapter 4 and James chapter 2, it'll show you the correct relationship between faith and works every time. Let me show you how it works. Let's begin with Romans 4. Notice here in Romans 4, 2 through 3, Paul says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now, notice he's going to explain why he has nothing to boast. He says, For, it's explanatory, for what does the scripture say? Now he cites Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, remember, in Genesis 15, 6, God had taken Abraham outside, and he said, look at the stars. It must have been gorgeous. No light pollution. He looks up, and he sees the stars, and they had to be just a gazillion of them. I don't know what number that is, but a lot of them. And the Lord said to him, so shall your seed be. That is your descendants. That was the great Abrahamic promise, that from Abraham come the descendants of the family of God. That's the point of it. And what does it say, the very next verse? Abraham believed God. He believed the promises of God, and it says it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham didn't earn it. It didn't well up from within. It was imputed to his account. He was declared righteous forevermore in the sight of God. That's the point of salvation by faith alone. Now, let's ask ourselves the question, did this happen before circumcision or after? It was two chapters before. So no one can say, well, it was really circumcision that saved him. No, two chapters. Circumcision doesn't come until Genesis 17. This is Genesis 15, 6. What about the law of Moses? Certainly you have to obey the law of Moses. Well, that didn't come until 400 years later. What Paul is showing you is justification and entrance into the family of God has always been by faith alone. Well, lo and behold, here comes James, ironically, the brother of Jesus. And listen to what he says. This is the problem that Martin Luther couldn't reconcile, but I think we can. If you ever think, by the way, there's a contradiction in the Scripture, you're making the error, not the Scripture. And I'll show you how this is easily reconciled. Notice in James 2.14, James says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Martin Luther looked at that passage and said, Up, oh, epistle of straw, I don't like that. Because he thought it contradicted what Paul was teaching right here. It's not. First of all, I want you to notice in the underline, what James is doing is he's not saying that faith doesn't justify you. He's qualifying what kind of faith saves. Notice he says, can that faith save him? Now, to be fair, the that is not a demonstrative pronoun in the Greek. It is the definite article. But that's the way I think we would render it in our vernacular. With the definite article, can the faith save him? It's can that faith save him. So James isn't saying, well, faith can't save you. He's saying, can that kind of faith, the kind of faith that never gives any exhaust, do you really have a functioning engine? That's what James is saying. Do you really have a functioning engine? You never produced any exhaust all your life, but you claim you got a functioning engine. That's the point James is making. Now, let's prove this. Turn your Bibles to James 2.21. Let's look seven verses later, James 2.21. Notice what he says. And as you're turning to James 2.21, remember Paul cited from Genesis 15. You're going to see now James is citing from Genesis 22. Notice James 2.21. James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? What's the point that James is making? The point that he's making is because Abraham really believed in Genesis chapter 15. He's willing to obey in Genesis 22. What was the promise given to Abraham? Let's not forget about it. 
Look at the stars, Abraham, so shall your family be. Well, where does that promise come from? It comes from Isaac. Well, if Isaac's dead, how is that promise going to come about? So Abraham reasoned, as it says in Hebrews 11, that he believed that he would be raised from the dead if need be. Abraham had such faith that in Genesis 22, he's willing to sacrifice his son, his only son, because God made him a promise. And Abraham knew if that promise is valid, and it is because God made it, then he's going to have to even raise up my son. So I'm willing to even sacrifice my son, my only son. Because Abraham believed Genesis 15, he acted on it in Genesis 22. Because he had an engine that was functioning, he produced exhaust. That's the point in the relationship of faith and obedience. Never forget the relationship between Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God, and Genesis 22, he's willing to sacrifice his son. Because if all the seeds of the family of God come from Isaac, well, then God's going to even have to raise him up. But what did God do instead? He provided a substitute. A substitute that foreshadowed the ultimate substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, who 2,000 years later would die at that very spot. He would go up with the wood on his back, and he would be dead, God's son, his only son, for three days, just as Abraham's son, his only son, for all intents and purposes, was dead in Abraham's mind for three days. Dear ones, it's faith alone in this son alone that will bring you into the kingdom and the family of God. But that faith will never reside alone. If you have a functioning engine, you will produce exhaust. And that's what it means to do the will of the Father. Every single person who does the will of the Father, Jesus said today in Matthew chapter 12, is a son and daughter of the Most High. And for that, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your scriptures. We thank you that there are no contradictions. We thank you that you have earned a way for us to become partakers of your kingdom and your family and that we don't have to try to earn it, which we could never do, that we couldn't work through it, that you've showed us in your scriptures that we could never earn by our own merits what you've done for us through your Son. We thank you for this truth, Lord. We do pray, Heavenly Father, that you would enable us to be those who are not just mere hearers of the word, but doers. We pray also, Heavenly Father, that in the weeks and months and years ahead, that you would also give us opportunity and give us people in our path, whether they be coworkers or family or friends, that we can preach the gospel to so that they too can be partakers of the kingdom and the family of God. We thank you for making us this through your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.